Now, in actuality, the substance that knows exists earlier than its form or its notion determined shape. For substance is the as yet undeveloped in itself or the ground and notion in its still unmoved simplicity, and therefore the inwardness or the self of the spirit that does not yet exist. What is there exists at the, as the still undeveloped, simple and immediate, or as the object of the picture thinking consciousness in general. Cognition, because it is the spiritual consciousness for which what is in itself only is insofar as it is a being for the self and a being of the self or notion has for this reason at first only a meager object in contrast with which substance and the consciousness of this substance are richer. The disclosure or revelation which substance has in this consciousness is in fact concealment for substance is still selfless being and what is disclosed to it is only the certainty of itself. At first, therefore, only the abstract moments of substance belong to self-consciousness, but since these as pure movements spontaneously impel themselves onward, Self-consciousness enriches itself till it has wrested from consciousness the entire substance and has absorbed into itself the entire structure of the essentialities of substance. And since this negative attitude to objectivity is just as much positive, it is a positing. It has produced them out of itself and in so doing has at the same time restored them for consciousness. In the notion that knows itself as notion, the moments thus appear earlier than the filled or fulfilled whole whose coming to be is the, the movement of those moments. In consciousness, on the one hand, the whole, though uncomprehended, is prior to the moments. Time is the notion that is there and which presents itself to consciousness as empty intuition. For this reason, spirit necessarily appears in time, and it appears in time just so long as it has not grasped its pure notion, that is, has not annulled time. It is the outer, intuited, pure self which is not grasped by the self, the merely intuited notion. When this latter grasps itself, it sets aside its time form, comprehends this intuiting, and is a comprehended and comprehending intuiting. Time, therefore, appears as the destiny and necessity of spirit that is not yet complete within itself, the necessity to enrich the share which self-consciousness has in consciousness, to set in motion the immediacy of the in itself, which is the form in which substance is present in consciousness, or conversely, to realize and reveal what is at first only inward, the in itself being taken as what is inward, that is to vindicate it for spirit's certainty of itself. Paragraph 801 is rather long and there's a lot going on in, in it which we'll have to unpack, but we can say that what we're doing here is moving from substance or, you know, thingliness through the spirit grasping itself in time, through time, through history, and then interestingly, moving beyond it, annulling, as he's going to say, tilgen is the, the term there, annulling time for itself. And what we get is, more and more complexity as we move from substance through time into the pure notion. And at each of these states, we do have the notion or the concept, but early on it's less developed. So Hegel is telling us you know, where we've gone and what still actually has to happen in this absolute knowing section. And we saw that a little bit earlier, uh, we raised time and we raised actuality. Now, he says, in actuality, in Wirklichkeit, the substance that knows exists earlier than its form or its notion determined 
shape. It's gestalt. Their previous gestaltin, right? And then he tells us what he means here by saying, for substance is as yet the undeveloped in itself. And we've always seen that in itself, just by itself. All right, there's going to be more going on. We have to unpack this. And so we can say, well, what is substance for? And we're going to see that it's for consciousness and self-consciousness. But we'll come to that in, in just a moment. He goes on and says, it is the ground, right, the grund, and notion, concept, begriff, in what state? In the state of yet undeveloped, uh, still unmoved simplicity, Therefore, he says, the inwardness or the self of the spirit that does not yet exist. But it exists potentially. It exists further out <laughs> in time once we actually have time, once we actually have movement through time. And we should also say in history, in human time, right? So we don't want... Uh, a substance that is just unmoved simplicity. We, want, we don't want something that's purely simple that we can just like goggle at. Oh, isn't that so cool? You know, no, 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 that's not what we're looking for. And don't get misled by Hegel's use, very heavy use later on in this paragraph of intuition on Schauung to think that it's just a, a sort of grasping without concepts, because, I mean, it's very conceptual, um, the, the simple substance. We don't want to rest in that. So he goes on and he says, um, what is there exists as the still, undeveloped, simple, and immediate. So what is there? What has existence? Ist da, right? Da sein. Sein is the verb. Ist is the, you know, uh, conjugated form of that uh, third person singular, sort of abstract, you know, ist da, it being there. By the way, there's going to be a lot of stuff where you're like, oh, this sounds kind of Heideggerian. We'll, we'll talk about that in just a moment. But that's, that's with the, the substantiality right now. What is there exists as the still undeveloped, you know, unfulfilled, simple, and immediate, or as the object of the picture thinking consciousness in general. So, you know, picture thinking, we encountered this back in the religion section. Well, we've encountered picture thinking or representation throughout the phenomenology. Each stage, uh, you know, engages in a bit of picture thinking, a bit of the philosophy of the understanding, as he'll call it a little bit. Uh, later on in a different work in the lectures on the philosophy of religion, as we've talked about many, many times. It's inadequate grasping of its own object and of consciousness and self-consciousness knowing that object. The spirit has not yet attained selfhood in this, even though it works through selves as it moves into time, as it moves into history, as it's motivated by recognition. So he goes on and he says cognition. Now, cognition here, erkentness, not a term that Hegel actually uses a lot in the phenomenology. And why is he using it here? Well, because erkentness, we could say, is one mode of of grasping, of understanding. Here he doesn't seem to mean it in the sense of conceptually grasping things, right? Wissen, true wissen, knowing, is going to be conceptual or through the notion. And erkentness, uh, understanding, cognizing, knowing in, in that sense of the term is, you could say, lesser or is less developed. So he says, cognition because it is the spiritual consciousness for which what is in itself only is, right? What is in itself could be more than just what it is in itself, but it's being treated as, it's allowing itself to be treated as, it's treating itself as just being what it is. Again, substance in this kind of pejorative sense. So he goes on and he says, um, 
is only is insofar as it is a being for the self, right? And a being of the self. Now notice here, so being for the self, right? We were going from the in itself to the for itself. And that self is spirit. That self is, is grasping itself now through determinate situations. What we're going to see in the next paragraph talk, talked about is experience, right? Uh, particularization. So for the self, but immediately following this, um, a being of the self. So for itself, of the self, these go together. And here he brings up the notion. And he says, um, cognition has for this reason at first only a meager, uh, armen, right? Poor, an impoverished object, Gegenstein. And that is the substance, right? So grounded notion and still unmoved simplicity. Not, not, nothing wrong with that, but it's just not all that it could be for us. It should be at this point in the phenomenology after having gone through so many dialectics. Now, he goes on and he says, in contrast with which substance and the consciousness of this substance are richer. So there's a, a danger of us just looking at, looking back at substance in our cognition of it. Our cognition is poorer. The substance itself is richer. This is what's going to be reversed, right? We're going to move from that dynamic into something better. And we already have moved into that. So he goes on and he says, now here's where, again, all this being there talk sounds Heideggerian. This is going to sound kind of Heideggerian to you as well. And we should always remember too, Heidegger did come after Hegel and Heidegger certainly did read Hegel because Heidegger talks about Hegel at many points. Hegel is one of the last great metaphysicians. Heidegger actually does a lecture course, a very short one, unfortunately, on Hegel's phenomenology of spirit. He only gets to the self-consciousness section. I wish he would have gone further, but he does talk about him in other places. Now, what's going to sound Heideggerian to you? The disclosure or revelation which substance has in this consciousness is, in fact, concealment. So how does that sound Heideggerian? Well, you know, uh, truth as this primal aletheia, a um, putting things into prominence, taking away the veil, you know, um, taking them out of forgetfulness, putting them right there in front of us. And with every um, making something prominent, there's also a hiding, concealment that goes on at the same time. You never have pure for Heidegger. You never have pure aletheia. You never have pure revealing. Now, revealing here for Hegel, not aletheia. It is actually, um, you know, Offenbarung, the word that we oftentimes will translate as revelation. Like, you know, when you talk about the revealed religion, the Offenbaris, uh, religion, often baris, often baren. Um, so uh, it's not exactly the same thing as what, what Heidegger is saying, and it's not exactly the same vocabulary, but the revealing, the showing, uh, is correlative to a hiding or a concealment, verborgenness, all right, verborgenheit, um, to, you know, put something... Uh, under wraps, you could say. So what, what's going on? This disclosure, revelation, which substance has in this consciousness is in fact concealment. Why? Because the substance is, so to speak, getting in the way. It is doing the concealing. The substance is still selfless being. So it's not truly spirit yet, right? What is disclosed to it is only the certainty 
of itself. And you might say, well, wait, wait a second there. How the hell does it have certainty of itself if it doesn't have a self? Well, that's what consciousness and what spirit is contributing to the substance as it's bringing it along, you might say. There's more here than spirit is actually understanding. So he goes on and he says, at first, therefore, only these or the abstract moments of substance belong to self-consciousness. So now we've got consciousness and self-consciousness being brought in here. And he says, sense these as pure mo movements spontaneously impel themselves onward. So it's, it's not just that spirit, you could say, drags substance and its moments along these moments, each of them has, has its own dynam dynamism, its own drive, and it is propelling itself. Now, each of them is involving consciousness and self-consciousness, to be sure. And now we're getting into time. We're getting into Zeit. And indeed, development and history. So, you know, this sounds pretty good, right? That's part of the Hegelian uh, whole shtick, the dialectic. And he says, self-consciousness enriches itself. So we go from poor to richer, right? Enriches itself till it has rested from consciousness, the entire substance, all that there was there before, and absorbed into itself the entire structure of the essentialities of substance. Okay, this is Aufheben. This is sublation being carried out by self-consciousness in conjunction with consciousness. Some self-consciousness, not the you know, earliest one of the self-consciousness section, not even the you know, completed uh, you know, forms coming after the master-slave dialectic, but the self-consciousness that we saw playing such an important role, seeking itself out in the reason section, trying to grapple with the ethical substance, uh, doing so in the spirit section in more and more complex ways, finally doing so in the religion section, and now in absolute knowing, that is what self-consciousness is doing on behalf of spirit in time. So he, he goes on and he says, um, since this negative attitude to objectivity, Gegenständigkeit, is just as much positive, uh, you know, negative, positive, it is a positing, a zetsen. It, 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 it's, so don't you know, associate positive with positing. There are two different terms there. It has produced them out of itself and in so doing has at the same time restored them for consciousness. I remember, self-consciousness is consciousness by virtue of being consciousness. In the notion, now he says, that knows itself as notion, now that's where we're heading. What he's going to call a little bit later, the pure notion, the reines begriff, right? So the notion that actually knows itself as notion in absolute knowing and has, you know, known itself as notion in less adequate ways in the previous uh, places, like in the religion section, as we move through to the the community, the ultimate religion, right? Uh, in the spirit section, even in the reason section, we could say. So the notion that knows itself as notion, um, the moments appear earlier than the filled or fulfilled whole, the gats. Okay, so now this is a term, or totality is another way of translating this. And, you know, very important to Hegel. Um, by the end, we should actually have a clear, I'm going to play a kind of a word game here, a, pure, a clear notion, clear understanding, a clear concept of wrapping our head around the totality, the whole, and our own place in it, and Hegel's own place in it, right? Which is not exactly the same as our own. We are two centuries later than him, as I've mentioned many times, and we have to think, if, if there's truth in this, we have to think this out in our situation as well. This is going to be uh, more explicit in the paragraph yet to come after this. So we've got the, the whole, right? And uh, he says, 
uh, in consciousness, the, uh, the whole, though uncomprehended, not grasped in a, a, a conceptual way, is prior to the moments. So, you know, the moments where they exist. Well, this is, again, also typical Hegel. Um, you have a totality. The whole is, in some sense, greater than the sum of its parts, right? It's greater than any one of its parts, but the whole exists because of its parts, and the parts have their meaning within the totality of the whole, and it's the notion that can, can grasp that. I mean, we can have other forms of grasping it, we, you know, representation, but representation is inadequate to actually doing that because it doesn't get the whole whole, so to speak, right? Um, and it also doesn't situate us as part of that in this dynamic um, relationship of, of comprehending, begreifen. All right, so let's go on. So he says time, now here's where we get a very interesting thing. Time is the notion itself. Oh, that's great. Let's just pause on that for a second. Doesn't that sound wonderful? What is time? What is human time or history? Well, it's the notion itself, right? It's what we've been looking for this entire time. Well, he doesn't stop there. And time is going to have to be annulled or canceled out. But we don't want to cancel it out too quickly, right? If we jump right ahead, we lose track of things. We, have to, we can only get rid of time or write it off, so to speak, when we get to a place where we can dispense with it. So he goes on, time is the notion itself that is there, da ist, right? Substance is also there, exists, has actuality. Time has actuality. And we don't want to lose that. So he says, uh, it presents itself to consciousness as empty intuition, right? Okay, so leeres anschauung. Um, these are two different sides of time. And, and you can say that this is sort of like a reference back to Kant, but Kant isn't the only person who's thinking about time and space as sort of the ways in which we have to grasp things. And um, so uh, he says, for this reason, because time is the notion that is there and presents itself to consciousness as empty intuition. For this reason, spirit necessarily appears in time and it appears in time. Now notice this, just so long as it is not grasped, it's pure notion, that is, has not annulled time. Now annulled there uh, could be translated as written off, canceled out. Right, so time is as the notion itself is is how spirit works itself out from being just substance, becomes conscious, becomes self-conscious, has a self, develops itself over time, doesn't just have a self, is a self in relation to other selves. That's how self-consciousness is, and it does so through time. It enters into time and transforms time into something more than just time, leading us to the notion. But the time itself is also the notion, isn't it? Just not fully developed. So he goes on and he says, um, when this ladder grasps itself, it sets aside its time form. It comprehends this intuiting. Now, comprehends, begreifen, uh, right? Begreift in this case, it's intuition. So intuition is being itself taken in and transformed in the process. It's not just empty intuition. It's not just impoverished intuition. It is intuition that, as he's gonna say right in the next uh, line, is comprehending, begreifenes, and comprehended, begreifendes. It's doing both at the same time. This is a very, very rich concept. The begreif, the notion, 
is also comprehending and comprehended intuition of what? Well, of this entire process of itself, of spirit, of the phenomenologist who is observing this, and of us. Us onlookers are part of this as well, if we want to be, right? So he goes on and he says, um, here we go. Uh, It is the um, outer intuited pure self, which is not grasped by the self, the merely intuited notion. When this latter grasps itself, it sets aside its time form, comprehends this intuiting and is a comprehended, comprehending intuiting. Time therefore appears Now, what an interesting phrase. As the destiny and necessity of spirit, the spirit that is not yet complete in itself. So as we're moving into absolute knowing, again, we're not getting rid of time. We're not getting rid of substance. They are attaining their truest meaning, scope, movement, whatever we want to call it. And it is, we could say it's spirit knowing itself through us, through Hegel, that is making this possible, that makes it possible for us to go beyond time and to transform intuition into something much more productive, much richer. So time therefore appears as the destiny and necessity of spirit, not yet complete in itself, the necessity to, now notice the language again, to enrich the share which self-consciousness has in consciousness. Okay, so that's part of the necessity. To set in motion the immediacy of the in itself, which is the form in which substance is present in consciousness, or conversely, to realize and reveal what is first only inward, in itself being taken as what is inward, that is to vindicate it for spirit's certainty of itself. Spirit is now self-certain. And we had that again back in the spirit section, didn't we? Yes, but we did not have the pure, or rather purified, purifying notion or concept. Now, did we? Pure here should be taken less as an adjective and more as a descriptor of what it is that the notion is doing and having done to it. Having done to it by what? Not by time, not by substance, by itself. And guess who that notion is? It's not something out there, estranged from us, a beautiful thing that we grasp. It's us. If Hegel's right, and he may very well be right about this this sort of thing. Um, I mean, maybe we don't even need all the, oh, history is finished. You know, we've gone through all the shapes of consciousness. I leave this to you to, to think about as we close out this paragraph. Can we have this triumphant ending that we're, we're working our way towards? Remember, this is paragraph 801. We only have seven more paragraphs left in the entire work, six of which are pretty long and involved like this one is, one of which is just a short little paragraph, right? Um, As we get so close, as we're getting to the end of this, could we buy into this? Could we get the fullness that Hegel's offering us without necessarily thinking that history ended in 1807 or, you know, 1814 or 18, whatever, right? That time still does play a role. Well, I I leave that to you to think about. And I'll just say that this is a really important transition point. We had those four paragraphs prior where we got time and actuality brought in. Now we see how time plays a role here for the end point that we are striving towards in this work. 